It's your Locked On Flyers podcast for Wednesday, September 21st, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that could really use some of that Nathan McKinnon money right about now. Yeah, or like Robert Palmer once sang, does anybody remember laughter? <laughs> All right, let's get the show going. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here with Russ Cohen, who's on Twitter at Sportsology. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. You can follow us on Twitter at Lockdown Flyers. You'll keep up to date on Flyers news and all of our episodes. You can email the show at LockedOnFlyers at gmail.com as well. On today's show, we've got that Sean Couturier injury news to talk about. Uh, That news broke just after we recorded yesterday's episode. So we'll get into that today. We've got a main training camp preview for you and some mailbag questions. So lots to get to today. Locked on Flyers is free and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, wherever you are listening. So subscribe. You'll get all of our episodes here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Plus, we're over on YouTube, so subscribe over there as well. Uh, Sean Couturier, herniated disc. I, uh, week to week, say the Flyers. And, uh, man, that's rough for him. Literally a week prior, you know, he's like, oh, I'm healthy, everything's great. And then uh, you, you just got to feel for him and for the team. Yeah, it's rough. Um, also, at the beginning, I meant to say Robert Plant, not Robert Palmer. But if I was Robert Palmer, it would be Bad Case of Loving You maybe uh, would be a good song right now. There's so many, <laughs> so many things running through my head. But uh, I do feel bad because I, I go back to, um, you know, months and months ago before Couturier ended the season, saw him skating. And I was like, OK, yeah, I get it. He's skating one last time. And, you know, so then he gets the surgery, he comes back, he's he's skating and he's. You know, saying, yeah, I feel good. And, and like you said, you know, literally a couple of days later, he's not. And so it's like a non-contact injury, uh, supposed herniated disc. You know, the thing about herniated discs, and I have one on my neck. I mean, you know, I've been living with it for my whole life, my whole adult life. I don't know the degree of his, but it's not like a death sentence for a hockey player either. And I think, I think mm-hmm. everybody has gone overboard on this because of Ryan Ellis and we can get into Ryan Ellis and what they're not telling us about Ryan Ellis in a minute, but I don't think fans should jump to the same conclusion that one, because one has nothing to do with the other. Now, yeah, totally different injuries, totally different injuries. Uh, I get it. It, you know, there are players that you want to see in the lineup and they're not, uh, you know, I think as a possibility, he's out for a few months, two, three months, and then can come back. Uh, does that hurt the season? Yeah, of course. But I don't think people should be talking about that contract in its totality. Like all of a sudden, this is like an albatross of a contract. Because I've seen players make remarkable comebacks from from injuries. Like I just, you know, I'm not writing this guy off. I'm not either. And you know he has the motivation for it. I mean, that is without question. And it'll just be a matter of making sure they know exactly what's going on and and come up with the right plan. Hopefully Mm -hmm. with a new health and fitness person there, they'll have, you know, some sort of better process surrounding it. We hope. Um, I th- I think that getting a second opinion sounds like a good thing to do. Maybe uh, even so a third. Maybe... You could get a third. You don't mm-hmm. have to stop at two. Yeah. So it seems like they're at least handling it okay for now, uh, as far as we know. But yeah, it's just it's just a real bummer. I gotta say. But it does raise the question for me. Were the PTOs that the Flyers just announced related to this news, do you think? Well, Anisimov for sure, because uh, he's Mm -hmm. a center. So there's no question that after, you know, the news comes down, it's like, oh, my God, we got to go bring somebody else in just in case. And it's like, 
you know, you wish that wasn't the knee jerk reaction. And, and I know Artem Yusnimov well, and I do think he still has talent. I haven't seen him play this last year in the KHL, but you know, he's got good size. He's a centerman. He's not necessarily like the best centerman, but he could score a little bit. He could play some tough play. He's played with torts. Um, so those things are all positive, but the negative is you've got some young guys that might be able to fill that role. And the minute you bring Anisimov in and you kind of throw him into the mix, that lessens the chances now of either Morgan Frost getting a guaranteed center position here where instead of going to the wing or Noah Cates getting switched to center or making it at all, even for Noah Cates, but possibly at center or Lawton getting switched back to center. You know what I mean? It's like the minute you threw another center into this, you, you're sort of now like diluting what you have already that you maybe could have used as a solution. Right. And, th and that's what I worry about, too, because I don't disagree that Anisimov, you know, for a fourth line center is a decent possibility here. Um, obviously, he, he isn't what he once was. He's 34 years old. You have to take that into consideration. But I worry that you have the devil, you know, versus the devil you don't know, or in mm -hmm. this case, I guess the flyer, you know, versus the flyer you don't know uh, for <laughs> for torts, because that's where I worry that, that, you know, either one of the kids or a Scott Lawton isn't going to be taken into consideration in the same way because of a trust factor that Torts has. And, and I think that's a mistake. I got to say, I think that Torts really has to work with what he's got here. And I just worry that Anisimov is going to get this one re remaining contract and prevent some other possibilities such as, maybe Tyler Wall, who's on a PTO right now as a mm -hmm. goaltender coming into camp. Uh, and I think that there are some question marks at goaltender in terms of the depth in the system in order to make sure that Lehigh Valley and the Flyers are covered with the right kind of goaltenders. And to me, that's the bigger priority here. And I think that, you know, Tyler Wall isn't the greatest goaltender you'll ever see, but I think he's an absolutely solid AHL option. Yeah. And if you have to bring Urson up along with Felix Sandstrom, because it's not like Carter Hart never gets hurt, right? right? So I think that just you have knowing Troy that, Grosinek. You're forgetting about Troy mm -hmm. Grosinek. Well, yeah, but then who fills in in Lehigh Valley? So... Pat Nagel. I, I, just Pat Nagel playing by himself? I don't think so. <laughs> no, I know. I just, I'm only randomly throwing out these names, not to trip you up, but just to show and, and to illustrate what you're talking about in the sense that this team's uh, flexibility is gone. There is no mm -hmm. flexibility. They have 49 contracts, right? Instead of 50, so they can only do one contract unless they make some other sort of decision. So, like I said, with all these PTOs, only really one of them can make it unless something else happens, another shoe drops. So, so there's that. And then there's just a matter of organizational depth. There's that. And, you know, again, even if you feel like the Flyers have been drafting okay, and I think they've been drafting okay, uh, the organizational depth absolutely falls on Chuck Fletcher and, and Brent. Brent Flair, because they're, they've been around for years here, and – they're the ones who are supposed to be scouting and helping to build that organizational depth from Lehigh to the to the Flyers. So then if there are problems, you can overcome some of them. And right now, everything is just sort of like, like a, you know, basically it's all being done, not like out of panic, but out of your reaction. Everything is a reaction. They're never doing anything uh, to get ahead of it. This is all just like, right. oh, we got a center out. All right, now we'll invite in a center. You know, it's like right. you wish they could get ahead of it. You do. And I think, you know, being proactive is something that Chuck Fletcher thinks he's good at, but he's not. <laughs> I, think, no. I, I think that's really what it comes down to, because I think even, you know, going into last season, he thought he had it down and his plan B's are just not viable ever. And that's where, where the disconnect is, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that everything that's happened is Chuck Fletcher's fault. He just hasn't done the level of preparedness kind of work in order to make sure that the plan B's are at least at a serviceable level. 
and they they just have not been and that's led to you know the the locker room problems the morale problems all of that because he's just throwing bodies into spots for the coaches to kind of try and fit it into certain spots that just aren't working right and it, this just feels like another attempt at that where Anisimov is a body here that mm-hmm. Maybe it's throwing towards a bone. And that's all it is to me. Yeah. And and again, like even with Antoine Roussel, let's say he does make the team and somehow they clear out a contract, whatever. What if he makes it instead of Zach McEwen? So then it's like, why did they sign Zach McEwen then? Yep. You know, like the, I said. <laughs> you know, that's the, it's going to make you scratch your head on some of these things with what might happen. And so, yeah, right now, the preparedness of this organization is not good. It's just not good. Well, speaking of preparedness, we've got a training camp, which is supposed to get the team ready for the season, which we will preview coming up next after we talk about our friends at BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week's games. BetOnline is your, also your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn about the trends and actions. Bet online where the game starts. All right. So training camp kicks off tomorrow at the Voorhees rink. And man, there are a metric ton of players in camp. It feels like a lot more than usual. And it does. So we have, you know, we've talked about a group A and a group B. Well, we've got a group C and a group D this time around. Normally there's like an A, B and some leftovers. So definitely uh, more skaters than usual. We have a day of practice um, in these various groups. Then the groups will scrimmage against each other up until that first preseason game on Saturday And uh, my gut says we'll get some cuts after that first game or that Sunday session, um, because according to the schedule, there's still a group A, B, C, D, right? So maybe that maybe those first cuts will happen after that Sunday session. Yeah, I could see that. I also could see um, Torts after just a couple of games, really whittling it down quickly. And I know there have been some camps over the last few years where you see like guys just getting, you know, sent back to juniors and other places pretty early on. I I see that happening in this camp too. Yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of preseason games then following that next week. So we have the back-to-back Tuesday and Wednesday. And in my estimation, that's when the phantoms will get split off and go their own way. And then it'll just be the flyers and who's ever left to be under consideration for that final roster. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. And I think, honestly, it's a good way to do it. Because at this point, you might as well let the Phantoms do their own thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think so, too. It's, uh, it's going to be a real interesting camp, I think, with so many people to keep track of. Like I said, 71 guys, uh, 41 forwards, lot, 22 man. defensemen, and eight goaltenders. Uh, which I guess, you know, if you're going to have four groups, you need that many. But it just seems like all of the camp invitees from rookie camp are sticking around, uh, at least for the beginning of it. And that it, it's just going to be, uh, like I said, a lot to keep track of for not just us, but for the team as well. And can they evaluate this many guys in an effective way in this amount of time? Well, that's a great question. Can you evaluate that many in, in a short amount of time? Not really. Um, but again, we feel like after the rookie games, there was at least a partial evaluation that was made already. So I think they're just going to have some of the guys in there just for, you know, a couple of days, maybe one preseason game to get a taste and just to kind of fill that camp role 
like the same way in football, you have like this camp quarterback because you don't want your quarterback to get all the throws. It'll be the same thing. It'll just take, you know, take the stress off of some other players from having to do everything when you know they have a long season ahead of the guarantee to make the team. So I think there'll be a lot of that kind of filler in there. Yeah. Uh, what is your take on what day one will look like out there? Just because it'll be like the nerves day with everybody kind of wondering what torts camp really is going to feel like. Oh, I think, you know, Twitter's going to be a blaze. I'm, I'm not going to be there for the first week of camp. I'll just start going to games because I have to go and cover some other things. But I think Twitter will be a blaze. I think everybody's going to sort of look for this insight as to what Tortorella is going to do and how he's going to do it. And I think there's going to, you know, right now, John Tortorella is going to deflect a lot of the bad things that are going on with with the team bad luck bad this bad that because you're everybody's going to be talking about him so for a little while that's a positive for the organization because it gives them you know time to kind of regroup here because again i'm not even sure what the marketing strategy is now but now they really should think about marketing the uh the young players yeah I, I think so too uh it's interesting because according to the flyers pr uh John Tortorella is going to meet with the media after that first session, the second session, and then after that game. I'm sure after that first preseason game, he'll have to do a post game. But then the next yeah. day, he'll have a more formal session. And to me, that's you know a perfect opportunity to review cuts that he's making and and talk about why. Yeah, and I think that's you know what it's going to be about. I mean, there's going to be a tremendous amount of focus on John Tortorella this first week of camp, more so than a lot of the players. And so we'll see, like, this is his camp. We'll see how, you know, how he does, you know, how he does with it, what he does with it. We'll see if anybody else gets invited in, maybe with even a higher talent level than what's been invited in. But we'll see. I mean, this may be it. This may be what they're, you know, running out there. And if that is, then, you know, Torts will make the best of it. and he'll probably make some decisions that will make your, your head scratch because he's probably got an idea of what he wants to sort of go to war with. Cause I think at this point he's, he, he has to know that his team doesn't stack up very well, even in the Metro. So he's going to have to do some other things just to keep the games close. Yeah. I think one of the things that'll be interesting about this training camp for me, relative to your typical training camp, I think is that in the past, at least I've generally focused on the prospects and who are the kids that could make yeah. the team and where are those battles for those fourth line spots, potentially third line spots and who's going to shine right amongst the kids. But because of John Tortorella, we're actually going to be focused a lot more on the veterans than we would have mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, how is James Van Riemsdyk going to handle this camp? What is Scott Lawton going to do? You know, he's you know, somebody who has been a somewhat steady presence. Is he going to kind of step up a leadership role at all with Couturier out? What's Kevin Hayes going to look like out there? And I, I think that really pulls focus a little bit differently from what we've experienced in the past. Yeah, like as an example, I fully expect them to pump up James Van Riemsdyk because at this point, looking at who might score goals this year, you know, it's him, Cam Atkinson, and then, you know, the goal scorers gets a little thin for for a hockey team. They're, you know, you still have connecting, you have Hayes and stuff, but but these none of them are big time goal scorers, you know. So I, I expect them to try and pump up Van Riemsdyk. I think Torts will be nice to him for a little while trying to get the most out of them. I, I think that's what they're going to do with a lot of these guys. But we also, you know, I've heard like Farabee's probably not going to be there. Right. And we, we talked mm -hmm. about that, that he might miss a month. So it's like already you're missing two of your best players. And, you know, there was at least a little hope that they might be able to start the season. And, you know, now that's gone by the wayside. So I, I, I don't even know what type of team they have. Yeah, I assume anybody who's injured is going to be there for the off-ice sessions because usually... Yeah, you get physicals too and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and, and everything. And they might have some availability for some of, of those guys as well, which might be interesting. But 
Yeah, I think it's going to be a much different training camp than we would have seen otherwise. And um, just seeing who kind of steps up and who is struggling, I think it's going to be indicative of what will happen in the end with all of this, like trying to account for the Couturier injury, account for the Joel Faraby injury. And it's going to be a, a much wider lens on the team as a whole. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Torts is going to try and make the best of it. I think if he doesn't feel he has a great talent level there, at some point we'll know that by something he says or does or whatever. And and then that's going to fall on Chuck again. Because, again, we felt like Chuck wasn't very proactive uh, these past few months. And, again, it just seems like things are being done last minute. And it does seem like he he's going to, you know, take the brunt of it again. Yeah, it it very well could be, and it's not completely undeserved. So no. <laughs> I think I, I think that uh, there could be some interesting fan interactions with Chuck, maybe standing up on that perch. Uh, that that could happen, but I, yeah. I certainly hope at least on the ice things go smoothly. Yeah, and, I mean, other than Cam Atkinson, I can't think of a player that we know that is sort of cemented in with you know the way torts wants to play mm -hmm. and 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 with this team as far as how that might look beyond that i i don't know who's gonna fit in with him i really don't i mean i i can't even guess yeah well guess we'll find out starting <laughs> tomorrow uh we will be back momentarily with your mailbag questions all right, some more good questions, um, especially given recent news. The first one, uh, interesting, we had a retirement day in the NHL yesterday. And this kind of does happen right before camp, usually for, with guys that you're not sure if they're going to sign somewhere or not. But Zdeno Chara, Keith Yandel, and P.K. Subban all retired. Were any of these defensemen worth considering for the Flyers this year if they wanted to play? No, and I think... Normally it goes a little further into the season, but because so many teams don't have money, I think that was part of it too. Um, why they, you know they decided now? Um, no, none of them. I mean, look, Chara is is a generational player. He's been fantastic. He could give you some offense. He always gave you defense. He always gave you um, physicality and fear. Um, the other teams didn't want to go near him. Sometimes he'd go in front of the net. Sometimes and he could be really trouble. Uh, but even after that first year in Washington, it was falling off for him and for, at, with the Islanders, not very good. So there was that. Uh, Subban's been having trouble for a couple of years now, and it's just been kind of going down regardless of mm -hmm. his age. Like he's even though he's like 33, you, you'd never know when it's just, you know, it's your body's had enough or at least for you to be effective in this league. Defense is such a hard position that it doesn't shock me that three guys went out at that position at the same time, because it's just so hard to play it. And we've talked about it, how sometimes it, it robs people's careers a little earlier uh, age wise. And then, you know, Keith Yando, like we, we know he's a good guy. We're not going we, through that again. <laughs> we're not going through that again. We, we, we know we've chronicled Keith Yando. I'm happy that he's able to retire and he had the, has the record. He won't have it for long, but at least he has it for now. And that's good. And, you know, I would say of the three, Chara is the only Hall of Famer, but all three are excellent players. They were all really, really good players. I mean, you know, Subban yeah, won a prime. Norris. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, I just don't think any of them provide at this point in their careers anything more than what the Flyers already have in the bottom right. pairing. So uh, I think that just kind of speaks to why they retired. Mm -hmm. Um. Next question. Does the Couturier injury give Tanner Lazinski a better shot at making the team out of camp this year? I don't think so. I still think uh, with what we laid out earlier, I think Frost still has the um, the inside track. And then after that, um, you know, Nisimov comes into play and Lawton comes into play because Patrick Brown, you could just pencil him in for you know, the 4C already. So where's the real opportunity mm -hmm. here? I think Lisinski would have to be like one of the best players on the Flyers period just to be able to make the team. Yeah, I think he would have to just go so far above and beyond expectations yeah. in order to to claim that spot. And 
I, I just don't know that Taurus will give him the chance even to right. put him in the right situations to do that. But uh, who knows? Uh, stranger things have happened. Uh, next question. Will Ian LaPerrier run the Phantoms the same way that John Tortorella is going to run the Flyers? Well, it's interesting because Bill Meltzer tweeted that um, Ian LaPerrier spoke to like Jason Martinez and he said that when AV was the coach, that AV asked it to be exactly the same way he was running the Flyers, which a lot of teams do. I mean, that's, you know, they want mm-hmm. the continuity and everything, but apparently Tortorella's, you know, giving Ian LaPerrier some latitude. There is some structure that he wants to keep, probably the way they play away from the puck and things like that. But then it's kind of like, you know, I think the way it was termed was they want to take advantage of the youth and the talent of the youth, and, that, and that's fine. I, I just, I kind of wonder if it's, you know, John's way of just saying, like, I really have my own way and it's really my way and it's hard to duplicate. I, I just kind of wonder if that's it. That sounds about right to me, honestly, yeah. that um, you can do whatever you want to try and duplicate it, but you're not him. Right. right? So you can't express yourself in the same way. And so, you know, you could do some basic systems thing, maybe on special teams, there'll be some similarities just Mm -hmm. in terms of formations and structures and, Mm -hmm. you know, set plays. But I think overall, I I don't even think that Lappy could do it if he wanted to. Right. So maybe that's why. Yeah. All right. Last question. And this is really from me because uh, I think that it's a question we all ask ourselves. I'm just curious your response, Russ, is are the Flyers indeed cursed? I don't believe in curses, and I've rooted for many bad teams in my life and still do. Mm-hmm. So I don't think curses exist. Do I think that there is bad luck? Uh, to a certain degree, I think there's bad luck. But I think a lot of times, if you trace the bad luck, you could find the source of what you consider bad luck. So I don't fully believe in bad luck all the time either. Yeah. I don't know. You know, there's this um, thought about Ed Snyder haunting the team from the beyond. And I I don't believe in that stuff for sure. But it's just sort of like at a certain point, like how can you explain all of this in the song is it the kate smith statue because they removed that what's the record (laughs) since then like you know i mean you could start pointing to a million things yeah correlation does not equal causation i guess right (laughs) right is is how you want to approach it but uh, sometimes on some days especially like yesterday I Yesterday think. was a tough day, man. Yeah, when we heard about the Couturier injury. It's a bad day. Um, yeah. It is absolutely a bad day. All right, wrapping up with our Flyers fun thing. Uh, the Flyers put out a TikTok that's just a cute little video with um, kind of freeze frame as guys are taking slap shots just to show that like pained facial expression. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, And I get it as somebody who is very bad at slap shots myself. Um Sometimes I like close my eyes, which is really bad. Should not do that. I only do a wrist shot. I don't even do a slap shot. I don't even bother. But I think I have to give Ivan Provorov the medal for best slap shot expression in this video. I'll say. Yeah, I would agree with you. It's fun. That's some good lighthearted stuff is is definitely going to be appreciated right now, I think, by the fan base. I think so, too. All right, that will do it for today's show. We're going to be back again tomorrow with Jordan Hall, who has been on this very program before, covers the Flyers, and very interested to see what his insights into this upcoming season are. As a reminder, we always want to hear from you. If you want your mailbag questions answered, you can tweet us at Lockdown Flyers. You can email us at lockdownflyers at gmail.com, or you can comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at rmiriam. That's R-M-I-R-I-A-M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S-P-O-R-T-S-O-L-O-G-Y. You made us your first listen today. Now make your second listen, Locked On NHL. Locked On experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. You can stay up to date on everything in the hockey world with Locked On NHL, your daily NHL podcast.
Have a great day, everyone.